So um, what I'd like to do in this hour is a little different than what I usually do. Um, I usually give a 45-minute talk on all the SBIR 101 stuff. And I think you can either know it already or it's easy enough to find out. I want to focus my short talk today on some of the new things going on with the program, legislative changes, and some things about clinical trials for a shorter period of time, and then just basically open it up to Q&A so we can just really have a discussion. I think that'll be a little bit more informative for everybody. And then my colleagues, Chris Densmore from NIDDK and Todd Heim from NIA will be giving talks about their institutes after lunch and a little bit more about their funding priorities. So um, the main place you can get all the information, including talks and webinars and a basic set of slides, is at sbr.nh.gov. If you're first time to SBR, how many folks here have never submitted an NIH SBIR and are planning to in the near future? Great. So click the yellow button on the left that says new to SBIR. That'll lead you through a step-by-step -step infographic with information all along the way. Also, importantly, go under the resources button. In the little blue menu on the left, go under the resources button. You'll find uh, links to sample applications, the application instructions, and importantly, what we call an annotated form set. It is all of the forms that you have to fill out and assist, but there's little boxes hovering over all the fields that tell you what to put in there. Little things that are hard to kind of understand. Um, also, that go along with the 200 pages of instructions. So those are some of the key resources that work uh, real well for everyone. So um, NIH, um, as a part of the Department of Health and Human Services, is one of 11 federal agencies. We are the second largest. These numbers are from fiscal 16, the last time that S the last data that SBA has for all together as they're working on 17. But at 17, well, that's actually blurry. But um, in 17, we were a little under $900 million at NIH. And on the pie chart on the left, you can see we're the second largest. Um, right behind Department of Defense, we're around a third of the program. And we're cross hatches because these are, this is color coded, so blue is contracts and green is grants. And we do mostly grants and some contracts, so we've got um, mostly green and a little bit of blue lines in us. Um, but this is now a $2.8 billion, $2.9 billion program now. But all these other agencies also do SBIR, of course, and in some cases, others like Army and the DOD also do life science technology. So there is some overlap with some of the things we're interested in. But you can see that the top five agencies account for 95% of the program by dollars. Within NIH, now we're gonna roll forward to this fiscal year, NIH is around 99% of the department's SBR budget. You can see here that in this current fiscal year, NIH's SBR program alone is $1 billion. CDC, the Administration on Community Living, ACL, and the FDA um, have uh, small SBR programs uh, shown above. We also have STTR at $141 million on top of that. And so there really is an incredible amount of resources that are dedicated to SBIR. This just describes the phase program of the uh, SBIR, phase one, small feasibility, phase two, full R&D. Um, we have a second phase two called a phase two B. Um, that's up to three or four million dollars for three more years. The number one question we get a lot is um, once I get my phase two, what should I be thinking about? You should be thinking about talking to your program officer about getting the next infusion of money called uh, phase two B, which is another three million dollars. I talked about that a little bit earlier. We have two new things that are back that I'll talk about in a few minutes. We had direct phase two, which went away last year and is now back and is implemented on the lower left. We have the commercialization readiness pilot program, CRP, that is, was gone in 18 and is back legally, but we haven't re-implemented yet. We're writing the funding opportunities for that. We also have a combination fast track phase one and two. Um, NIH uh, is a, uh, collection of 27 institutes and centers that collectively make up the National Institutes of Health. They're shown on this slide. Um, my office sits in the office of the director. And it, there is no, uh, it is common misconception that there is an NIH budget. There actually isn't an NIH budget. There are 27 line item appropriations from Congress for each one of these parts of NIH that collectively, when totaled, make the NIH budget. And so this year we're operating um, at about $39 billion uh, overall NIH-wide, and a subsection of that is for SBIR. 
and we will uh, send you to consult with a program officer at one or more of these institutes. And it's usually pretty easy to figure out where you belong based on what you're doing. The titles of the places pretty much give it away. When we take those 20, uh, to 24 of the 27 institutes do SBR and STTR, their budgets are calculated and we take a percentage of them uh, as shown above for purposes of SBR and STTR. As I said in the upper right, it's a billion for SBIR, 141 million for STTR for a total of 1.14 billion for this fiscal year. The pie chart is the 24 institutes in order by their budget. So National Cancer Institute starting at 12 o'clock noon, uh, National a Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, Heart, Lung, and Blood, Aging, NIA, Aging. Todd will be here to talk about Aging. In aging is now the fourth largest institute. They've received an incredible amount of additional funding every year. Um, NIDDK is kind of at uh, 8 o'clock in the blue, and Chris will talk about that this afternoon. But the point is that what many folks think is you, you know, a small institute you know, on the upper left doesn't really increase your chances of getting funding because they don't have a lot of money. And in fact, usually the opposite is true. You should really be putting your application in the best fit for you. Institutes with small to medium-sized budgets also get proportionally less volume of applications. And so the overall success rate, which I'll talk about in a minute, are NIH-wide. But even a place like National Cancer Institute, NCI, looks like they have all the money. Well, they also get all the applications. Everybody's putting in cancer indications, and so at an institute level, NCI tends to have lower success rates than average because of the volume of applications. But you really want to put into the right place here. So this is uh, success rates from uh, fiscal 17. I had some 18 slides which didn't make it in here. Um, but everything on this chart is for, oh, this, this is really not showing up well at all. There's actually gray bars next to the blue bars that are showing up on the computer screen, but not on here. But I'll, I'll read them to you. And these are available uh, after the fact. So um, the blue bars are SBIR. And so phase one in the second bar is about 16%. It's around 18% last year in 18. <coughs> phase two is around 37 to 40%. That's about the same this year, a couple of points higher. The second phase two, phase two B is 40%. The direct phase two, which is, was gone in 18, so there's no success rates for direct phase two in 18, but in 17 it was around 28%. The commercialization rate in this pilot's around 29%, 30%. So on, but the, the gray bars you can't see on the left. Fast track is 17% uh, for STTO. Actually, the numbers are there, actually. Uh, phase one is 16%, phase two is 39%. It's all a couple of points higher in 18. So we're about 20% for phase one and fast track. And so um, when we look at what these volume of numbers are, <coughs> if we look at the very bottom row, we get over 6,000 applications per year. Both, all phases, both programs. Um, SBIR phase one, which is the entry point for most people, is over 3,500 applications. We fund over 500, 15%. It's higher um, this, this past year. And you can kind of see the volume. Fast tracks are around 10% of our volume. Direct phase twos are around 10% of our volume. And you can really see overall we make around, in the lower bar, around 12 to 1,300 phase one and two awards per year to about the same number of companies on six or 7,000 applications. All of this is publicly available data. You click on the link at the bottom um, or you go to our website on the lower left, you'll see awards and successes. You can pull charts that are Success rates, you can look up your state. We have success rates by state. We have success rates by women and minority owned small businesses as well. I talked a little bit this morning about um, new applicants. And so this chart shows a 10 year course of the blue bar is new applicant companies, first time to NIH. They might have, you might have applied to other agencies, but first time applicants to NIH for SBRS TTR is around 30 to 35%. Uh, per year, and the orange bar is awardees around 33%. So about a third of our applicants and awardees are new. And so there really is fresh new blood coming in every year to the program from companies. We make awards all across the country, and as you might uh, not be surprised, the states that tend to do well and have biotechnology clusters obviously get more of the money. 
um, by volume. This is just a heat map of dollars in states for SBIR for a four-year period, 2012 to 2016. Um, obviously, California, Massachusetts light up real dark with more money. Um, and so, um, and then, you know, we do try to focus some of our outreach on the, the states that don't get as much money. However, um, when you divide this by population and you go per capita, it actually levels out a little bit, um, except for Massachusetts, which has always got a, a large number of companies. So we do work to ensure that um, we do outreach in states that don't get a lot of funding and more outreach to women and minority entrepreneurs. Um, because we want to make sure we try to do the best job we can to uh, spread the wealth around. So now I'd like to just talk a little bit about a legislative update that's been an incredibly active area um, the past year or two. Um, and there's a lot going on. Hopefully it's settled down for a couple of years. We can just kind of get going here. Um, the entire suite of programs, federal-wide, are authorized through fiscal year 2022, and that was done a couple of years ago. And these are congressional mandated programs, and Congress sticks an expiration date on them. So Congress must pass a law uh, minimally with a new expiration year on it um, from time to time. But the programs are now through 2022. We, everything I'm going to talk about we lost last fiscal year in 18 because they had separate expiration dates. But now, as of this August, all are back. So we had four pilot programs which are extended now through fiscal 2022. We had the SBR Direct Phase 2 that is back. Our January deadline two days ago was the first due date we had where Direct Phase 2 was re-available. So that is uh, excited that we have that back. A big change from last time is that you can now apply for Direct Phase 2 at the application level. And what I mean by that is prior, a couple years ago, we had Direct Phase 2 specific funding opportunities that only accepted direct phase two applications. You couldn't apply on the omnibus for direct phase two. Likewise, you couldn't apply for a regular phase two on a direct phase two. Well, we have some new forms that came out, and on the SBR, STTR information form, there are check boxes for everything now. So now you can apply for direct phase two on the omnibus or on any other SBR funding opportunity by just picking uh, that choice over a regular phase two. Um, this is important, this is only available at NIH, it's not available at the CDC, FDA, or ACL, and it's not available for STTR by law. Direct phase two is specific to SBIR. So that is, we're happy to have that back, and that was obviously a real popular program. It's designed for companies that have got some resources and have done the equivalent of phase one, enough resources to do the equivalent of a six month to one year feasibility study and have the preliminary data that they can put into their direct phase two application like they would a phase one final progress report. There's that. The commercialization readiness pilot program, CRP, we also invented an activity code called SB1. Activity codes are the NIH bureaucratic nomenclature for our programs. A phase one SBR is an R43. Enough people understand that. A phase two is an R44. A commercialization readiness pilot is an SB1. Um, we're working to update that program and make it more user friendly, both for you, the community, and us as an agency. We may have that on the street for the April deadline. If not, we'll have it on the street for the September deadline and beyond. That's also available back for 20, uh, till 2022. We lost but re regained our SBR administrative funds, so we're allowed to take a little bit of SBR money and use it to do outreach, travel, develop commercialization programs, and to assist companies and do outreach and all kinds of different things. We have that authority back. Um, and lastly, we were able to got, get back the authority to run what we call phase zero proof of concept centers. We call that the REACH program which stands for Research, Evaluation, and Commercialization Hubs. This is a program where we use some STTR money and give them to academic university consortium to pull in academic entrepreneurs, give them an ecosystem, and spin off stronger SBR and STTR companies that better are able to compete. And we have that RFA for five new nationwide proof of concept Senate consortium on the street with a due date of February 19th. This is not open for small businesses to apply for, but for universities to apply for. And the goal of this program is to bring in academic entrepreneurs, give them a little bit of money to do some feasibility work, and if it's strong and there's a good business plan which they get help with, then you spin off a company and apply for phase one or fast track or direct phase two, and you have stronger companies. 
But um, there, I know there's going to be some university folks here, and you can definitely take a look at that. So um, that's the things we lost and we got back. There are things we had but got changed a little bit. And so uh, the law in August changed to give us update an authority called discretionary technical assistance. It changed the name to dis, uh, technical and business assistance, TABA. This is where you can request up to uh, a few thousand dollars in your application and you could hire a vendor to help you with commercialization. We use that authority to hire Foresight and Larder to provide our niche assessment program and our commercialization accelerator program. But you also have the authority to request money to hire your own vendor. You just can't do both. What this law did was up the amount of money. So phase one, you can request now up to $6,500 per year in phase one to hire your own technical assistance vendor. And now up to $50,000 in your phase two, up from $5,000 a year. That's where the real big change is. Your typical two-year phase two, you, can request, you could have requested $10,000 in the past. Now you can request $50,000. You might request this to hire a regulatory consultant, patent attorney, um, or uh, other kinds of work you needed uh, for uh, technical and business assistance, but you have to request it at the time of application. We don't do it after the fact. And you have to stick it in the budget form in the other direct costs. So every budget page at NIH is three pages. The first page is the personnel. Uh, the second page is um, the equipment and, and the travel, and the third page is the other direct costs in the F&A. On the other direct costs, there are three empty lines, eight to 10 where you put things that don't fit anywhere else. And the instructions tell you is you write the word technical assistance in line eight, nine, or 10, whatever you need, and write the amount of there. And then you provide a, a paragraph or two in your budget justification on what you're going to do, who you're going to hire, get a letter of support, what services they're going to provide. And this allows us to know that you've done this. this is, uh, but if you do this, you can't use our programs that we uh, apply for, that we provide and we pay for for you. But it's an important new authority. I'm not going to read this, but the goal of this authority is to help you with the B in SBIR business, get services that are not ordinarily allowable costs. Things like um, doing some market validation, some IP work, looking at product sales, development, and regulatory plans. Within this $50,000 or 6500 you can do specialized things you can't really do um, when, uh, under the rest of the direct costs. Um, so it, and we have all of this is cut and paste out of our application instructions. So you can go to our application instructions, do a control F, look up technical assistance, and you'll find everything in there to, down the way. Funding opportunities or FOAs, uh, FOAs. This is where all this is how you this is how you grab the money, um, how you apply for the money. SBIR.nih.gov/funding. It is actually impossible to read, but they're in bins. So the first bin is the four omnibus, all the main ones. The second bin is all the targeted solicitations. We have 80 to 90 other targeted solicitations on the street. Some of them are institute specific, might be a special scientific area. I was talking to some uh, folks in my one-on-ones. NIH receives specialized money to combat the opioid crisis. And that uh, initiative at NIH is called HEAL, and we have HEAL uh, funding opportunities on the street, some of which are SBIR, and they all can be found under the targeted. There's direct phase two buttons. There's all kinds of buttons. And so talking about the omnibus, 70% of our applications and awards come in, in and out of these omnibus. There's four of them, two pairs, one for SBIR, one for STTR, clinical trial required, no clinical trials allowed. And they're all shown here. It's a little more complicated. Um, because NIH uh, developed new policy in the past year or two to better track and control clinical trials. But ultimately, your typical R&D project under SBIR that's not going to use clinical trials is going to use PA 18-574, and then 575 for STTR. If you're running a clinical trial, you use the top ones. We just had a due date two days ago. The next one's April 5th. These expire. Um, everyone kind of thinks the planet is going to explode after these expire. Um, within a couple of weeks, we issue new ones. Um, and they're open you know, th two or three months before the September 5th deadline. We do webinars after the release of every opportunity at least two to three months before the deadline with any uh, system updates. But please don't think that we've canceled the program.
Uh, I get that a lot. When the uh, omnibus expire, we must have canceled the program. So I want to talk a little bit about clinical trials because I'm here to tell you some of you think you're not running a clinical trial. And I'm telling you some of you are. And you're not going to like it. You may not agree with it. But some of you are going to be running NIH-defined clinical trials. The top four lines is the definition of a clinical trial. I'm going to read that. I'm not going to read the below. Those are the definitions of the, of the items. Um, and then I'm going to show you a quick shortcut. A research study in which one or more human subjects are prospectively assigned to one or more interventions, which may include placebo or other control, to evaluate the effects of those interventions on health-related biomedical or behavioral outcomes. The definitions of the rest of that is below. But it really comes down, and we actually have a decision tree on this, a four-question yes-no answers. There is no maybe. There's no gray zone. You answer yes or no, and you have to be honest. And if you give four yeses, you're doing an NIH-defined clinical trial whether or not you like it or care. If you get even one no, it's not an NIH-defined clinical trial. And I'll tell you, that's important because if you answer four yeses, you're doing a clinical trial. You have to use an NIH clinical trial funding opportunity announcement and fill out the human subjects and clinical trial form, which is a new form. Does your study involve one or more human participants? The vast majority of people uh, are going to say yes, because if you're not even in humans, you know you don't have a clinical trial. Are you prospectively assigning human participants to interventions? Do you intend to evaluate the effect of that intervention? And do you have a health-related biomedical behavioral outcome? Four yeses, NIH clinical trial. At least one or more no, you're not. And there's actually a link. There's a whole decision. This is all online, and you can click through it. Um, there's a lot going on. We have a website all on clinical trial stuff with the definition, um, this decision tree, advice on the form, um, and all of the like on our website. And so lastly, um, we have plenty of time on purpose. So I want to do a Q&A. Um, the most th important thing you can do to stay informed is to um, be involved in our listserv so you don't miss anything. And I told several people today um, about our listservs. There's two ones you want to sign up for if you don't already. The top one is my listserv, the NIH SBR listserv. We don't abuse it. We're not going to send you like 10 emails a day. It's one every couple of weeks or one a week for really important things. When we issue new big funding opportunities, our conference, where we're going to be, new initiatives, new policies, you just send an email to the email above. The second link, NIH Guide for Grants and Contracts. NIH issues funding opportunity announcements in any and all areas every single workday. And nobody can keep up with it because we issue over 1,000 funding opportunities a year. Every Friday at 3 p.m., there's an NIH-wide email that goes out to the second listserv that consolidates and gives you a bulleted list of everything we've issued in the past week. Program announcements, requests for applications, RFPs, and policy notices that have new guidance on them. You want to sign up for that listserv to get the Friday afternoon email. In any given week, there may or may not be SBR and STTR funding opportunities, um, but there may. And there might be a targeted one that exactly fits your area that you want to know about. And frequently we find people who, you know, they didn't realize until a week before there was a better funding opportunity than the omnibus. You can find out about it when they hit the street. Also, a good way to find out is talk to a program officer. Ask them, I'm doing this. I want to know what's the right funding opportunity. I know about the omnibus, or I don't. Is there, a better, is there an RFA or another PA that might be better suited for me? And they'll give you advice on that. Everything we fund, every uh, SBR funding opportunity that hits the street is cross-posted on SBIR.gov, the SBA Central website, and we post it on our own website. So everything is posted in two or three places. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter. And our, the bottom email goes to my central office and just goes to the people here so that you know, they can answer while I'm here talking to you if you're sending them a question right now. So with that, we have, I, I, I made a short presentation. I didn't talk about a lot of the nitty gritty um, because I want to leave time to just have a round table and, and answer lots of questions. Thank you.
teach program, the phase zero proof of concept thing. Yes. Uh, like with the NHFAI, what I heard is reaches not for places like UCSF or Boston or something. What is the take? And are well, you think as if they want history uh, traditionally to uh, give those to centers which are less funded by NIH, states which are less funded by NIH. And that's a question I had. And also, uh, like when you say there are going to be five centers, mm -hmm. does that mean? Uh, for specific NIH institutes or broadly, just So I would encourage you to read the funding opportunity in full. That's going to have all the information. This is the second round of these. We had three sets, uh, six actually prior, and the UC system was a prior awardee, and some bought. Right, but it's the, it uses the same authority in part, and so. Other parts of UC, uh, the UC system that weren't prime awardees could potentially put together an application, a consortium, and apply, and it will be evaluated. We do want to spread these um, across the country geographically and make sure we have uh, applicants address the NIH mission as broadly as possible in terms of our high priority disease areas. Um, but prime awardees that won these awards prior are not eligible to apply. Uh, but the, you could rearrange the consortium or come up with new consortium. But I would encourage you also, we have a webinar coming up on January 23rd on this REACH program. In the funding opportunity announcement, there's a link to the, an informational webinar where you could watch what's going on and then ask questions and get them answered specifically to that. The second question about, it's an, this is an NIH-wide program. It's going to be run by the Heart Institute just for logistics, but it's not heart and lung related. It's trans-NIH. And the five centers, we have not designated them to be covering this disease or that disease or this institute or that. They're all going to be trans-NIH. And we want the, the, the funding opportunity to talk about addressing, I think, high disease burden areas and how the, it's up to the research institution how best to do that and identify potential entrepreneurs who can cover those areas. Are there any restrictions around U.S. ownership or partial foreign ownership of company applying? Now, just general SBR question, right? You're not talking about the REACH. You're not talking about SBR eligibility, correct? Absolutely. There are so many uh, restrictions. Um, SBIR and STTR companies must be majority owned by U.S. citizens or permanent residents or by another U.S.-owned company that is itself majority owned. Majority foreign ownership, majority nonprofit university ownership are not allowed. Um, venture capital, two or more VCs can own an SBR firm if the US owned, if the US VCs and be okay. That's a very tiny number. But the vast majority of our companies are a handful of founders, one or a handful of founders, all US citizens and permanent residents. So foreign ownership, majority, and a lot of times universities in their incubator spin-off companies and spin-off companies and take an ownership stake it has to be minority uh, uh, minority ownership less than half of the ownership shares um, sometimes universities think they're trying to help and be a majority owner of the company that kicks them out immediately of eligibility out of SBR and STTR and a lot of things more questions yes sir does the money need to be spent in the United States that's an excellent question. Does the money need to be spent in the United States if you have a clinical trial or outside? The answer is, by and large, yes. The money is, has to be spent and used uh, in the United States, and your subcontractors or consultants have to be all US-based. There are rare exceptions to allow some of the money to go abroad if you have unique patient populations or resources or expertise that is not available here in the US, even for less. So, you know, a malaria vaccine trial obviously is going to happen in Africa. That's okay. Um, we, I've heard some other stuff about having some heart disease studies where there's a good population in another country um, and a disadvantage. There's plenty, you know, so that's not going to be allowable because there's an adequate supply here. But you have to make the case. We don't grant permission in advance. You have to make the case for foreign uh, justification in, in, uh, in your proposal and what the unique aspects of that are that cannot be found here. 
And just because a collaborator or a CRO might be cheaper abroad is not sufficient. Yes, sir. So the question is, in a uh, clinical trial, frequently a large percentage needs to be subcontracted out to a contract research organization, or CRO, to run the trial. How does that uh, connect with the SBR subcontracting limitations of 50% in phase two? It's not that relevant in phase one, where the money's smaller. It, it interacts quite directly um, and harmfully in that respect. Um, phase twos, you can sub out half of the money. We have a little bit of discretionary wiggle room, but not 70 or 80 or 90 percent. So something imp and, uh, important to keep in mind is these um, SBR grants from a government point of view are called grants in aid. They're not meant to fund the total amount of the project. So if you have other resources to pay the CRO beyond the, the subcontracting limitations, that's okay. But additionally, this CRP program I talked about, the Commercialization Readiness Pilot Program, where you can get another $3 million on top and during a phase two or two B, that does not, on purpose, the way we designed it, have subcontracting limitations. So if, you, if you've won a phase two or two B, you can get a CRP at the same time, and you could sub out 80 or 90% of that if you need to. Just keep a little bit of money for oversight into the, into the prime. So that's the mechanism, that's a main mechanism, and a new flex, newer flexibility to allow clinical trials to be subbed out properly to CROs. Yes, ma'am. Does the funding applicant have to identify the vendor, say, for the business assistance? Yes. And then does the NIH have an approved list of? No. So if you're requesting the 6,500 or the 50K, do you have to identify the vendor? Yes. Identify the vendor, get a letter from the vendor, what support they will provide for you, describe it in your budget, describe what you expect to get out of it. Do we have an approved list of vendors? No. I don't say we won't ever have an approved list. This new, part of this authority is new, and SBA is working with us as well. There may or may not, in some future point, be a list of approved vendors. But there are plenty of vendors, and frankly, most of them are here this week at JPM, that are more than happy to work with you on various aspects of your uh, proposal. It's not designed to just give money to your, your um, CFO uh, to do some things. It's really meant to get outside advice to help you along the way. And we will take a look at that pre-award to make sure it's appropriate. More questions? Yes, sir. So for confirmatory clinical trials, phase three, mm -hmm. when would be the right time to engage? Is that prior to ID submission or prior to ID? So for confirmatory, confirmatory clinical trials, phase three, when's the right time to engage for regulatory and, and the NIH? You can always ask us any question anytime. It's incredibly rare you're going to get a f be able to fund a phase three trial with SBIR because phase three trials are large and usually multi-million dollar, if not higher, and there's just not the scope of the vet. You know, when we fund clinical trials in SBR, we're talking phase one or 2A, maybe 2B trials. It just depends on the disease and the scope and the number of patients. Not that we won't fund a phase three trial. We will, but it's got to fit within the scope. You know, you want to talk to your program officer, you know, about this uh, when you're, when you're uh, ready to do so. We're also building up the ability to offer regulatory advice to uh, applicants through hiring regulatory consultants in my office to be able to have cons consult time um, in different areas of FDA. So it's something that um, also when you're um, participating in our programs, uh, phase one or two, you can, especially phase two, we have a commercialization accelerator program whereby you can get specific regulatory advice through that program. But um, you can also hire consultants now for that too. But you can always con you know, talk with us about what you're thinking of and the right time and we can connect you with the right people to give you the best advice. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, in your prior panel presentation, you made some mention of having kind of a clearinghouse or some resources for areas to look uh, for additional funding to pass the phase two. Uh, what's the best way to interact with you or uh, your institute? 
So um, you really want to talk to your program officer about what they have. You know, some of the things we do are in our expanding are we pay to send companies to bio, uh, the biotechnology industry organization. We send companies to Resi, to Advamed, to other investor for, to the Life Sciences Summit by the Angel Capital Association. We um, vet companies who are awardees um, who are interested and they, um, we will pay for your, you know, these, these expensive registrations. Maybe travel if you have an active grant, but some of the, like going to bio, we have a big, huge 80 company innovation zone. We're going to have that next summer in uh, Philadelphia, and we've done that in the past. And so your program officer or your SBR lead for your institute, which you can find on our website, will have information about the opportunities we have for those type of connections. Um, we're also running pilots in, my, in our central office on access to our entrepreneur in residence, and now we have two. And so some of our institutes have additional ways they can help you. Ultimately, that'll be rolled out broader, but we're piloting how we're going to handle it and what kind of advice and how much time we can offer. Um, all of these available uh, to you at no cost, other than your, your time. But you're welcome. Question, I saw, I just got and ask it. Oh, there we are, sorry. Uh, and then, then you, sir, after this. Go ahead, up front. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, opportunities that are there for digital health. Digital health. Especially as it relates to entrepreneurs who have um, separated themselves from the universities because I've been very fortunate to get NIH grants when I was a researcher mm -hmm. at PSF. But from the time we spun out the company with the iCOP program after that, we haven't been successful mm -hmm. uh, in being able to get a grant. So, so maybe we can talk a little bit about that. So digital health is a growing and continuing to grow portion of our portfolio, 10 to 15 percent-ish of our portfolio. The biggest portion of our portfolio, by the way, is medical devices um, overall at NIH in terms of SBRS, TTR. So digital health continues to grow. And um, parts of our, age, you know, our institutes are interested in various aspects of digital health if you're covering you know, diseases and things re re relevant to them. We do have some other institutes that will handle platform technology. Um, but it's really about talking with program officers and using some of our, um, their resources about what's, you know, what's going on in your applications that's not getting you to the finish line on funding. What are the issues? And your program officer can really help you read between the lines of your summary statement. Um, you see one summary statement, you see two or three, they see hundreds. And they know what they fund and what they don't fund and what's in summary statements they fund and what's in summary statements they don't fund. So they can kind of give you a broader uh, feel for what the challenges you are and what the reviewers are have uh, issues with. Um, now, digital health is, is, is new and expanding, and so we're working to bring in the right kind of people for those reviews. But that's what I would offer. Who would you suggest would be the right folks or the title of the folks that we should be talking to? Well, I mean, at NIH, you're just going to speak to program officers, and they can you know, direct you around. Um, we don't have specific digital health people per se at NIH, but we do have some digital health SBIR funding opportunities on the street. If you go to sbr.nh.gov slash funding, click the targeted solicitations, do some keyword searches, you'll find some opportunities that might work for you. Hmm? Behind you, yes, sir. Um, I run a non-profit acceleration incubation program for life science companies, and that's uh, associated with the University of California. I was wondering if you have any programs that supports acceleration of technology commercialization, as opposed to just, you know. So the, the, the quick answer is not really, except that we have the exact things for this REACH program are exactly designed to accelerate commercialization, accelerate spin-outs of companies. Um, SBA has funded growth accelerators in the past, and we've provided co-funding to SBA to fund life science-focused growth accelerators across the country. Um, but in terms of uh, specific funding for nonprofit accelerators, um, we don't really have anything at, you know, like that available at NIH. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. What type of replacement? Uh, enzyme replacement. Enzyme replacement therapy uh, for rare diseases. So that's a very specific 
uh, technical and scientific scope question, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS, has a rare disease office. So that's the place I would recommend you talk to about that. But you know, we are very much involved in any biomedical and any disease and any therapy, and especially for rare diseases. Um, what we, you know, from my earlier panel this morning, this is one of the key places where Venture and Angel are not, Venture mostly is not involved in because the markets are going to be very small. Angel is a little bit more involved in rare diseases, especially if angels have family members or friends who have the rare disease. But um, and, and within NIH, the NCATS part of NIH covers rare diseases, and they would be interested in talking to you. And if you stop by my desk, I'll give you the, the, the uh, contact for Lily Portia, who runs the NCATS SBR program. Hmm? Yes, sir. You talk about talking to program officers. Is there a good way to approach them? I mean, I'm old enough to remember when they used to have stacks of grants all over their desks. Right. Approaching them in the middle of chaos was not the right way to do it. Is there a better time of month, year? No. You know, there really isn't. When you, you contact them when you're ready early. The easiest way to do it is shoot them an email ask for a time to set up a phone call. Send them a short, you can send them your abstract, you can send them their specific aims page. Should be non-confidential, although every communication with the government is a confidential communication, so you don't have to kind of, I know companies sometimes worry about that. But um, send them an email with a summary of your tech and set up a phone call. You know, there's you know, thousands of people working at NIH, it's always not a good time for somebody. Somebody's always on vacation. There's always a council coming up, there's always a study session coming up, so just, Shoot your email when you're going to have the conversation and go from there. <coughs> yes, sir. Are there uh, any SBIR opportunities associated with the All of Us initiative? The question is, are there SBIR funding opportunities associated with All of Us, which is the regenerative, no, it's the, um, the, genomic the genomic database. There probably are. Um, you just have to go look on our website and do some keyword searches and, or call the All of Us people. Just look up NIH, all of us, find some people there, or write me and I'll connect you. But there, I'm sure there are. Yes, sir. Is there any contradictions in applying for SBIRs for multiple agencies, DOD, NIH? So that's a very good question. Are there conflicts with applying for SBIRs, TTRs, between multiple agencies, essentially sending in the same or similar application to NIH? to National Science Foundation, to Department of Defense? The answer is no, you are allowed to do that. You have to disclose in every application that you're doing so. And then if you would be so fortunate as to be up for funding on two or more of them, you can only accept one. We won't duplicate fund. That's, a lot of people go to jail when that happens. And it's not gonna be, and it's, and it's not gonna be us. So, so you can do that. You cannot though within NIH send the same application to two or more institutes. You can request secondary and dual assignments, um, but one application for the, uh, per project in NIH. You can't send in the same project to Cancer Institute and to Heart Institute. You, get a, you, you can get a secondary assignment so they're both on the same one application. I think there are two different indications. Can that be two different indications is going to be two different end products, really, and that's fine but you can do that. But for the exact same project, you, you don't want to do that. And if you're going to send in two or more different projects, different indications, we recommend talking to us about it and staggering the due dates so that you're not competing against yourself in study section. More questions? I know the last question is between us and lunch, so yes, sir. Uh, if we got an FBI one, Absolutely. Um, if you've got a company A who's won a phase, are you talking about that? Company yeah, A? Company A yeah, so company A won a phase one, company A went under, or they're not interested in pursuing the phase two. Company B, um, through a collaboration or through transfer or license, wants to pursue the uh, phase two. They can do that. Um, in fact, um, that frequently happens. Um, 
And you can just close that and get a letter, um, if it's available, uh, that they agree. And if the company still exists at time of award, we will ask company A to send in a formal relinquishing statement that they agree to relinquish the grant and the rights therein to company B. If the company doesn't exist, you can just do it anyway. Um, and that, 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 that's fine. Any more questions? I'm doing one-on-ones till 3 or 4. Um, I, I'm booked up till 2.30 or 2.45, but um, we can slot some time in if you want to talk anything else. Thank you all very much.